Will Sergio Rob Chrysler defeat Fiat? Defending the dealer franchise system and how cafe could become a bitter cup of coffee. Plus, Matt O'Leary talks Ford tough. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone. Your journey, our passion. And by Hyundai. See what makes Elantra so nice. Check out its style, interior space, fuel economy, and popular features now. This is AutoLine After Hours with John McElroy, episode 252 for August 1st. Kicking truck tires with Ford's Matt O'Leary. Watch AutoLine After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time or 2200 GMT. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or by following the links on our website. Hey, I think I recognize you. You're Gary Vasilash, aren't you? Yeah, CEO of Basic Motors. I mean, um, <laughs> how are you doing, John? Good to see you. Hey, it's, uh, I've been out of the saddle here for a couple of weeks, so it's you great have. to be back. Good to see you. And we should note, too, that our colleague Lindsey Brook from SAE International is going to be joining us later, but he's stuck in traffic. And uh, when he walks in, we'll just welcome him into the program, mm -hmm. too. And then we've got to mention our special guest right now, Matt O'Leary, the Vehicle Line Director for Ford Truck. Great having you here, Matt. It's great to be here, John. So Vehicle Line Director, I've heard of Vehicle Line Executive. What does Vehicle Line Director mean? So Vehicle Line Director is responsible for uh, programs, you know, different programs. So I have North American trucks, SUVs, and commercial vehicles. So F-Series pickup trucks, Expeditions, Transit, E-Series, um, everything from soup to nuts. And then I also work in, you know, it's kind of a hobby on uh, global cargo. <laughs> so we have a cargo <clears throat> heavy truck that we sell in South America and also in uh, Eastern Europe and Turkey. Uh, so I have responsibility for that as well. Now those are, yeah, sorry. I was going to say with the transit launching basically or, you know, coming into the market in a big way in the here US. in the U.S. Yes. And the F-Series coming, how can you possibly be sitting here? And not, you know, <laughs> toiling away somewhere. And uh... Well, everything, we're on track. You know, everything's going, <laughs> going great. I mean, launches are tough, but, you know, the team's working through the issues. And, uh, I mean, we're, we're so excited about the product. We can't wait to get it out there. Both of them are great products. So and we've been trying to get transit here for years. Um, and we're finally bringing it to market. And uh, Big one and the small one. Yeah, the big one and the small one, the Transit Connect as well. So... Um, and that vehicle, you know, it looks big, it looks a little bit intimidating, but when you get in it, it drives really small. Uh, the driving dynamics, you know, anybody can drive it and feel comfortable in it. That's what's so cool about it. As opposed to the, you know, the Econoline that we had was so big and massive. You know, it's a little bit, you know, daunting trying to drive it through. Plus, what, lots. the bones of that vehicle, the old Econoline, I want to say go back to 1976. Yeah, somewhere back there, somewhere, a long I, time I, I, ago. I'll bet if you look, I'm awfully close. It's, I think it was in the 80s, but, you know, it's somewhere in there. It's a long time it's been there. So, uh, so we're really happy about the transit. And then, of course, the F-150 is just phenomenal. The, uh, between the aluminum body and all the technology, you know, that we're bringing in. And, you know, as we were talking about the 2.7 liter EcoBoost. Talking about uh, that earlier. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. Um, with the auto stop start, I mean, that is um, surprising. I mean, when people get in it and drive it, they won't believe how good it is. I'm telling you, on paper, that engine looks phenomenal. I, I keep talking about 30 PSI turbo boost, 10 to 1 compression ratio, and yet it'll run on regular gasoline. Yep. And that's, that's magic. That's engineering magic right there. Before we get to the F-150, um, talk a little bit more about why the Euro-style commercial van seems to be coming to America in great numbers. I mean, you guys have it. Uh, we've had the Sprinter for a while from Mercedes. Um, Nissan's building one. Um, Ram's got its... Uh, Ducato. In, yeah, Promaster City. Well, well I mean, well, where, where did this at, come from? If you look at fuel prices and where they're headed, and, um, you know, fuel economy is a bigger deal now than it was before. And so to do that, uh, most people are looking for, you know, where do we, 
where we really good on fuel efficiency and providing cube for customers. And we've had the transit. And so it's the perfect product. So when we redid that, we said we're gonna we're gonna make that global, you know, which is part of our one forward plan to take mm -hmm. things global. Um, and it works, right? Very fuel efficient, lots of cube. And transit for for uh, us in Europe, if you look at uh, the UK, transit's been the best selling truck in the UK for 48 years. So even a longer string, you know, we're, we're proud about the 37 years for F-Series, but 48 years in the transit in the UK, just phenomenal. And I think we'll do really well with that product here in the US as well. I, I think picking up on Gary's point though, what about the styling? I mean, I, I know a lot of Americans are looking at these vans going, whoa, doggy, what's this about? <laughs> I, think they'll, I think they'll warm up to it. I think it's, um, you know, it's a different look. It's more aerodynamic. Um, I think it makes it less intimidating, and I think when you get it into city centers and all that, it's more maneuverable. So I think they'll get. I think they'll get by the styling. I like the styling. I think it's neat. It's got to grow on me. Of course, I got to see these things out in the street, not just in press release photos. And yeah, and we just started releasing some of them to the dealers, so you'll start to see more and more of them as the year progresses. So I, I'm trying to think about this now. You got an all new Transit Connect, an all new Transit. You got an all new F-150. You've got what a new Explorer coming along the line here someplace. Although Explorer is probably not part of your truck part. No, no. no. Okay. Expedition. But, Expedition. Yep. But still, I mean, so I, I've never seen Ford have such an all new lineup of trucks before. This is uh, this is a very busy year for us. I mean, we've got um, 16 launches in North America. Jeez. Uh, you know, major product launches. Um, so I've been busy, um, <laughs> but it's great, you know, because it's all new product uh, coming out with. So, so we've been investing in this, and now now you're starting to see the, you know, the product come through the pipeline. It's just fantastic, and you know, we we're building a brand on having the freshest showroom. Uh, in the industry. So, you know, expect to see more and more as time goes on. One of the questions I had, as you noted, in Brazil, you make this class eight semi that's also what assembled in uh, Turkey. Yeah, it's assembled in Turkey and then also in our plan in San Bernardo near Sao Paulo, Brazil. And then in China, Ford owns some big truck company that makes Semi trucks as well. We own uh, JMC. JMC bought a partnership in uh, Tijuana Motors, which is you know another um, heavy truck. So company. Ford used to be a big player in Class Seven and Eight trucks. Got out of it a little over a decade or so ago. It was renamed Sterling, and then uh, Freightliner bought it all. Right. But when I start looking at these Class 7 and 8 semis in South America, Eastern Europe, and China, it makes me think, is Ford got a plan of getting back into the heavy truck market in North America? Well, that's probably, you know, a long ways out, John, but I think, um, you know, we're certainly trying to grow um, cargo business um, in the emerging markets. It's a great vehicle uh, for that. It's been, you know, cargo is to Brazil what F-150 is to the United States, right? I mean, is the truck, it's iconic in Brazil. There's a lot of pride in it. And uh, we've got a great partnership with Ford Autosan, um, who, you know, produces it for us in, uh, in Turkey. In fact, you were selling them in the U.S. about 10 years ago or so, right? They, they made it this way for a few years and then it was dropped. Yeah, I think I think you're right. It might have been more than ten years ago, been, right. but it, but it was yeah, just for a limited time, and it was when I can't remember class... anything. I say, oh yeah, it must yeah. have been ten years ago. <laughs> <laughs> but it, I don't think it was class eight. I think it was more seven. Know, yeah, yeah, six right. or but seven. Still, or, yeah, you know, you, you you look at Daimler, which makes a ton of money on big trucks. Volkswagen just went out and scarfed up Scania and Man for the engines of it. Right. They're making big money on their big trucks. Right. You know, that makes me wonder. Why. Profitable growth for all, right? <laughs> so you got a, you know, and it's small, medium, large cars, utilities, and trucks. So, mm -hmm. you know, we're going to play everywhere. Matt, you mentioned um, Turkey, and, and one of the uh, people in the chat room, uh, Rivera Natario, wants to know, why are so many vans made in Turkey? I mean, not only you guys, Good but, but uh, there are, one of your competitors has a... Uh, van manufacturing facility there as well. Why well, Turkey? Well, we've had a, uh, a joint venture with Ford Autoson there, and we've been, you know, leveraging that facility. They've got a, um, a pretty capable supply base, 
um, with you know low cost. Um, certainly the labor rates are low, but um, they're also in a good spot, you know, in terms of shipping to uh, to Europe or anywhere else. So logistics, yes, yeah, so logistics uh, really um, plays a role in that as well. Mm -hmm. Have they set the, uh, themselves up to do that, a la the way that Thailand set itself itself up to do pickups? Or did it just sort of happen? I, I think it was just, it just sort of happened, mm -hmm. right? We had a, um, you know, we, we did some business with Ford Autosun, mainly, you know, in the cargo, and then we just started growing it. And how else can we use, you know, that capability in Turkey? And, and it's, been, it's been a great partnership. So let's talk F-150. I'm dying to ask you a bunch of stuff about that. <laughs> how is it all going? I mean, I got to imagine you guys are biting your nails because this is a big roll of the dice in a way. I mean, a, a very calculated risk on the part of the company. Right. But, you know, all new engine, all new buy, all new everything. Right. You know, massive rip-ups of the plants. You know, when you introduce that much variability into any kind of a program, yo, it's, uh, there's a lot of opportunity for mistakes. What, sure, what could but possibly it, go wrong with all that? <laughs> what could you know? possibly go wrong? But, you know, it's not all new engines. I mean, it's two new engines, right? Still, that's a and lot. So, and so we are, you know, there are some things that we're bringing in that are stable to help ourselves. And, you know, aluminum isn't, uh, isn't new to us. Uh, you know, when we owned Jaguar, we did an aluminum uh, intensive vehicle. Hey, wait a minute. I'm going to interrupt you now because our other colleague, Lindsey Brook, on, has Lindsay. arrived. Lindsey? Come on in, Lindsey, and put a microphone on. You have to do your own work. <laughs> Good to see you. Nice to see you, Matt. Yeah. Thank you. So you got caught in traffic, huh? I did, but the Fiesta ST that I'm driving cut through that traffic like... Oh, my God. They <laughs> wow. paid you to come in here <laughs> yeah. and say that. <laughs> So we were, I, I, I forgot the big Toyota pickup truck outside. I just thought it'd be equal yeah, right. time here. <laughs> <laughs> so good to have you here. Thank you. So anyway, you were saying about uh, all new, all these changes on the F-150. Yeah. And the aluminum, as you yeah, pointed out. Aluminum. When you had JLR, you guys maybe taught them a thing or two of what to do. Right. So we've, we've got a lot of experience in aluminum. Now, again, this was a big undertaking, but we did our homework. Uh, we did, uh, you know, we've been thinking about this for over five years. Um, did a lot of research on, um, you know, aluminum itself because that had progressed quite a bit from when we did, you know, the Jaguar. Um, and we could do a lot more with the properties to meet, you know, different requirements for safety, crash, NVH, whatever. Um, and even for repairability. And so, so we went through everything, all these work streams before we actually kicked off the program. And... You know, the F-150 team, you know, I'll say I think is the best team in the business. And, and we've got our, our A team on, you know, the biggest project. And, yeah, we know it's a big challenge, but we're, we're confident um, and we are on track. I mean, you know, the fact that I'm here today and I'm not getting, you know, 20 phone calls and, you know, panics, um, it, is, it is going well, and, um, which is fantastic. You know, I just... Like I said, I'm so excited about getting the product out, and and er, all the talk has been about aluminum, but but you don't really see the benefits it brings in terms of performance and stopping and and corrosion and dent resistance and all that stuff. And when you get in the vehicle and drive it, I mean, it is a game changer. It's really a game changer. Did you guys look at alternative materials? I mean, you know, the aluminum has has obviously taken all the air out of the room in terms of any other discussion about the vehicle, but I mean, had you, had you looked at some of the advanced ultra high strength steels or looked at composites or looked at, at something else, or did you guys we, sort of focus on saying, you know what, we're going to go down this path? And we did look at um, high strength steels, but we couldn't get the weight savings out of it that we could with aluminum. And so we went a lot more high strength steel and ultra high strength steel in the frame itself um, is a way to get, because we needed the strength there. Um, but aluminum was really the only way to go, and um, there's some steel in it, very little. You know, the dash panel, I think, is steel, and that's about it. Uh, but everything else is aluminum, and, and for us, it gave the most efficient design, most efficient weight savings. Um, and even if you look all through the, the uh, value chain in terms of repairability or anything like that, it made more sense to just do it all in aluminum. Mm -hmm. Did Alan Mulally play any role in that at all, having come from Boeing, or was it really the truck group that said, hey, let's go it, aluminum? It was the truck group because, 
you know, when I had the, um, the uh, F-150 when I was the chief engineer, right after we launched the 2009 All New, we started thinking about this. And I was a bit skeptical at first about aluminum, but when I looked at where the customers were going and if we really wanted to lead, this was the right thing to do. So I was convinced right away, and then I went on to corporate strategy. So I was in the room when they had all the discussions, which was great, you know, because I, I felt vested um, in that. And the thing about Alan was um, we didn't have to convince him <laughs> that aluminum's a good thing, <laughs> right? He was, he was somewhat familiar with yeah, the just, for some just reason. Just a little bit, just yeah. a little bit. But, you know, the thing that was good, you know, and Alan is just a great coach, right? So he said some, you know, he had a lot of experience to bring to the party and things we ought to check out. And he really helped us with the aluminum suppliers, right? Um, so, yeah, he didn't, he wasn't the one that said, yeah, you know, let's go. I mean, we, we all collectively made that decision and he just bought in and then, uh, then helped us where he could. He did Matt, how did you guys deal with capacity? Yesterday at the ICAR conference, uh, Pete Reyes made a comment that, he said there wasn't enough aluminum sheet in North America to support the volume that you guys would be having, you know, 700,000 plus units. Uh, how did you deal with that? Alco and Novellus had to come on, but, uh, you know, they weren't really ready for this. Yeah, well, you know, it took a lot of close collaboration uh, with Alco and Novellus. Um, one, to make sure that, that they could see where we were headed. They wanted to be a part of it, because just think of what it's doing for the aluminum industry. I mean, this is a huge transformation for them. Windfall. So, yeah, so they wanted to be in on it. We wanted to make sure we had enough you know, capacity um, you know, to cover all of our needs. Um, so we work with them to build that capacity and, and get it ready, and, and it's worked really well. And I've learned probably more about, you know, uh, aluminum every, from raw material all the way through stamping, clinching, welding, riveting than, you know, I ever wanted to know. But it's, it's, a, it's so exciting to see the experts really go. I mean, they know their stuff and, um, and they've thought through everything. They thought through all the things we have to worry about, whether it's in the plant variability, whether it's um, repairability in the plant as well as, you know, outside. They've been through everything. I mean, the whole company has been in on this, trying to make sure because we all know it's a, you know, it's a major change, and we got to get it right. And um, but that's what leaders do, right? So, so did you have to change essentially everything in the plants? I mean, the welding equipment, the stamping equipment, or at least the die sets, um, in in a way that you wouldn't have changed them if this were a say a steel vehicle. Um, you know, the the material handling devices, the uh, the paint booths. Yeah, you can't, you know, the magnetic pickup doesn't work too well. <laughs> <laughs> Guys so, wondering why their sheets are stacking up at the end of that press. Yeah. So, so, yeah, we have had to, to, to rethink that. And even though we could use some of the, the presses, certainly the dies are different. And, um, you know, we do a lot more riveting uh, than you do with steel. Um, you know, all different kinds of joining uh, techniques that we've had to use. So... Um, that has been a challenge, uh, both in terms of making sure we have the design right and the parameters set for that, um, and from a manufacturing standpoint, that we can control any any variability. Now, you guys had a program that was, I won't say it was rumored because a lot of people talked about it, it was kind of called F100, kind of a, a truck that fit down kind of in a size below the incumbent F-150 at the time. Uh, and you could argue that a smaller pickup, you could also get six or 700 pounds if you downsize the truck. Could you talk about not wanting to do that, you know, to keep a full-size pickup, a full-size pickup, and instead take mass out through materials and through design? Well, you know, when we looked at the market, um, first on the compact end, that, that segment, you know, was shrinking quite a bit. Um, and a lot of it was because the um, pickup trucks had better value than the compact trucks. The price difference wasn't that, that big. Mm -hmm. uh, gas wasn't that uh, expensive. And so, you know, we saw um, full size is the right way to go. And then in terms of trying to get to um, a, a lighter vehicle that doesn't tow that much, I mean, that's, that's really what we're looking at with the 2.7 
leader eco boost with auto stop start because that's really aimed at people that don't need all the capability um, and they're maybe more concerned about fuel economy and right I think in the sweet spot you know it goes up to 8,500 pounds towing and 2,250 pounds uh, payload mm -hmm. so we think that's the right balance of people who just want you know they want that vehicle for the occasional imperative when they have to tow something or haul something but it can also be, you know, economical from a, from a fuel economy standpoint. But all these trucks are getting bigger. If you, the other day I saw a uh, F-150 from a couple generations ago, and it looked like a mid-sized truck. Yeah, <laughs> I saw an F-350. I couldn't believe how small it was. In 1986, F-350, I could not believe how small it looked. You know, so I, side impact is kind of raised belt line, so the truck, you know, then the, then the box has to get taller, so the truck gets bigger. Uh, were any customers saying, what about parkability? Yeah, you have to you have to watch the parkability. Um, you know, I think we kind of pushed the limits with the 2009, uh, but the customers are are fine with that. Uh, that seems to be the right size. What they really want is you know the maximum flexibility between people carrying and cargo carrying, and so with that you know that longer uh, crew cab that's kind of the sweet spot for them because it gives them, you know, the best of both worlds, um, especially with the flat load floor, right? So you can load anything in there that you want to. And, you know, we don't want to walk away from that. So we want to give the customer not a compromise, but, you know, kind of the and solution. Mm -hmm. And going aluminum was really, you know, the way to do that. And it allowed us to downsize engines and other things to, to save weight. So, um, to me, that's the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hey, look, uh, this might be a good take, time to take a quick break, and we're getting a lot of questions coming in from the audience. Good. We'll get to them in a minute. So, Carmen, let's give a good shout-out to our good friends at Bridgestone. Introducing a car company that's never made a single car. We took the power of a nine-year-old V8 and gave it the impressive handling of Firestone's destination tire. Now, moms agree, every milk run feels like a victory lap. So whatever you drive, drive a Firestone. Okay, we're back with all kinds of questions coming in from uh, the audience right now. JJ says the F-150 is so big, they need a smaller pickup. Well, you kind of addressed that. Yeah, but uh, there, there are some people out there who would like smaller ones, too. Yeah, I and think so. Obviously, but I, Chevy and GMC are going to go that route. Right. But, you know, like I said, that segment has been pretty much shrinking. And, and it started out, the compact pickup was, you know, cheap transportation. You know, a lot of people bought it for the kids going off to college or whatever. And it was compact. And it was compact. <laughs> and and there were so, but there's so many different choices out there now, right? That's kind of why. So it's almost a, a tweener. And I think that's, there is a market there, but it's, you know, pretty small. And I don't think it's going to grow based on what we see. And, and if you look at where we're going with the F-150, right, we're getting the fuel economy, um, in the performance that customers are looking for and still giving them the package. You're coming out with this Tremor too, which is not a whole lot bigger than the, the Chevy Colorado or Canyon, right? The Tremor F-150, isn't that a shorter wheelbase or a shorter box? Um, you know, I'm not sure about, okay. about that one. It might be a shorter box, but it's okay. not, it's not, not a, a smaller vehicle. Okay. It's still yeah. an F-150. <laughs> Mish Carfan says, okay, all this talk about the F-150, I was hoping to hear more about the Expedition and EcoBoost. Is that engine strong enough to power that big utility? Absolutely. Well, we yep. knew you were going to say that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Predictable. But, I mean, Lindsay, you had a chance to drive it, right? It's got 365 oh, yeah. yeah. horsepower, 420 pound-feet of torque. Right. I mean, it really matches well with the rest of the, the I vehicle. think if you had welded the hood shut on that vehicle and told me that it was a V6, you'd think it was a small block V8. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's, um, you know, we've had it in our F-150 uh, truck, um, so it's proven and customers love it. Gives you the best balance between, you know, power and performance and fuel economy and really how you want to drive, right? I mean, you're in control. You decide. JM1NB says, was there anything that you could have done in aluminum but didn't do because of cost or production reasons? What would have been the next aluminum thing you would have added? 
I think, you know, I said before, the only thing that, uh, that we kept in steel was the dash panel. We've got the quiet steel dash, right? Uh, so it's a laminate. It's a laminate. And we right. couldn't find um, a way to do that with aluminum that was as effective. And we're all about being quiet, so that's when we said, okay, we're not, we're not going to go there. Now, you know, maybe eventually we'll figure out a way to do that and, and we'll get it in. But A laminate aluminum. So, so purely, but purely noise attenuation, and that's, yeah. that's why. Yeah. So structurally you could have. Yeah, structurally. So really about the only thing you could do is an aluminum frame. Would that make any sense? Uh, we did we did look at that, but I think for for what the frame needs to be, steel is the right answer. Yeah. Uh, Sean wants to know: Have you ever heard of the Ford Ranges in Antarctica? The Ford Ranges in Antarctica. Did, did no. any of you guys know part of Antarctica is named after the Ford family? There's a yeah. mountain range there. Really? Yeah. Just like the mayor of Toronto. I won't do that. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. <laughs> <laughs> That's good, Lindsay. <laughs> yeah, uh, Admiral Byrd, the guy who flew over the South Pole. Was he in a trimotor? Was in a Ford trimotor, and the expedition was funded by Edsel Ford, and so he named this mountain range the Ford Ranges. That so there you go. Thing. Part of Antarctica is named after. Who said Ford. you can't learn anything? That, on that's right. That's why we all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right Knight wants to know what about uh, high winds and bridges? How's this lightweight F 150 do in crosswinds and especially on bridges? The 700 pounds make a big difference? No. Well, yeah, it makes a big difference, but it's planted, right? So it's, it's not like it's light and you feel like you're going to blow away. Um, that that really doesn't get into it because the it's all in the suspension and how you tune the suspension, and actually you just get a better ride and you get better handling. So, uh, not an issue on. on so the Mackinac suspension. Bridge, no problem, no, no no flying off like no. the uh... <laughs> no flying off. <laughs> you go. No, I, yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, Bad Nickel wants to know: Will there be a lightning bolt, a la Thunderbolt? And I'm not sure what that means. I think he might be oh, the referring lightning? to the, the, the F-150 SVT. Lightning. Yeah. And, and if you look at where we've gone with SVT, we have the Raptor, right? right. Um, which is an awesome truck. Yeah, which is an off-road vehicle. Ooh, is um, it going to be an aluminum Raptor? Well, we don't, you know, talk about, future speculate products, about future but, product. But, but you didn't um, say no either. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Next question, yeah. yes, <laughs> exactly. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Oh, yeah, going back to uh, the transit, will the U.S. market get the front drive or just the rear drive? Um, both, depending on the application. In the U.S.? Yes. We'll get front drive and rear drive. Yes. Oh, very good, very good. And w w you've got these new engines coming on uh, the, the F-Series, but did you keep any of the big V8s for the heavy-duty versions of the F-Series? Um. I mean, the ones that, uh, the answer's no. We've got the 6.2 uh, the that we have on the Super Duty, right? But uh, for F-150, it's, you know, the 3.5 V6 and the 2.7-liter um, EcoBoost, 5-liter and the 3.5 uh, GTDI. So, and that's plenty, especially that, given that the is. lighter weight. Right. It's more than enough. And then you had that V10. Is that still around? Yeah, the V10's still around. I, I think uh, we offer that on our um, uh, some of our Econoline uh, cutaways. Mm -hmm. Chassis cabs. Chassis cabs, right. right. Uh, mm -hmm. Yep. Well, good. Anybody else got any any questions? Well, yeah. If and, and you guys know your customer. Ford truck knows its customer better probably than any industry segment, any automaker. Matt, if if aluminum is affirmed by the F-150 customer at 700,000 units a year, people just love it. How about the heavy-duty customer? Well, I think, you know, the thing um, that I found is, you know, when we say something is built for tough and, and we put that brand on it, it really means something to customers, and they trust us. Um, you know, when we came out with the EcoBoost, we did all kinds of testing on that to make sure it was built for tough. And it means something to our customers. And we actually did much better than we thought we would um, in terms of customers accepting that. Because, 
you know, who would have thought we could put a V6 in a truck, right? And then people would accept it just like they do a V8. And, you know, it was an overnight success. So I, I think, you know, if we decide to put it anywhere, you know, we do the testing and we say it's built for it tough, I don't think anyone will have an issue with it. And if you look on the heavy end of the market, Lindsay, I mean, toolboxes, you know, semi-trailers, <clears throat> I mean, those people are familiar with aluminum. Yeah, class they know how pads have been is. aluminum for a yeah, long time. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I don't think there's any question about, you know, can it be tough enough? Mm -hmm. yeah. So do you, do you think aluminum will become, tr become transparent to the customer at some point? Just as Lindsay was saying that if you welded the uh, hood shut, he wouldn't have known there was a six under the hood. If you just looked at the truck, used the truck, worked with the truck, you wouldn't know what the hell's made. Yeah, the they won't. It, it, it'll be... Yeah, so truck. what? It'll, it'll be a truck. And, you know, when people, so what I was saying before, when people get in the truck and drive it, they're going to forget about aluminum. They're just going to be talking about the attributes that they experience in the vehicle, right? And that's what they're going to be looking for. Um, and, you know, it is a big change, so people are going to look. But even if you look at, I think UBS did a study recently, you know, and these customers are accepting. In fact, some of them are willing to pay more for um, aluminum. Um, you know, they're so uh, intrigued by the thought of having an aluminum intensive uh, vehicle. Mm -hmm. I can't wait to drive it. I think anytime you take 700 pounds out of a vehicle, look out. Wow, it's going to ride, steer, brake, everything. Be more better. nimble. Yeah, yeah you'll, right. you'll know in the first 25 feet that it's yeah. different. That's, that's I mean, it's said, that that's, quick. That's better than my 100 yard. Test. Yeah, right. Yeah. You won't have to go 100 yards, John, trust me. Matt, it's been great having you on the show. I, I, I know you got to head up north to your place up there. We're going to cut you loose right now, but it's awesome having you come on and talk all about this truck stuff on After Hours. Well, thanks a lot for having me. And, and you know, I really love this format because, you know, it's really informal. We're just talking about the business and, and you guys are just as passionate about it as we are. So thanks for having me. Good deal. Thank you. So, Carmen, let's give a shout out to our good friends at Hyundai. Nice. Not nice. The new Elantra from Hyundai. Nice. It's time again for the biggest movable feast, of metal that is. It's the Woodward Avenue Dream Cruise. Join John McElroy along with a million of his closest friends and eight lanes of classic cars all coming to you on Friday, August 15th at 4 p.m. Eastern. It's the 2014 edition of Auto Line Live from Woodward, where hot rods are welcome. Okay, just as Matt was leaving, he did correct himself on the, the transit. In the U.S., we only get the rear drive version, not the front drive. At least for now. Who knows what will change in the future. But, uh, so yeah, what have you guys been doing? Oh, <clears throat> covering the F-150. <laughs> <laughs> I was just driving the uh, ATS Coupe in... Uh, Cadillac. Yeah, the Cadillac. Yeah, what'd you in, think? Uh, they did a very nice job on that car. It's... Uh, um, was Johan Denison out on no, the trip? No, he wasn't. Oh, man. He doesn't, he doesn't officially start until the tomorrow. Is that right? Yeah, so the 1st is when oh, he eight, starts. Yeah. Okay. August 1st is when he starts. But uh, it was very interesting that, that one of the things that they, they did emphasize was, uh, I was talking to the chief engineer on that program, uh, Dave Mash, and was talking about there's, um, compared to the CTS Coupe, the structural rigidity of the ATS Coupe is 42% greater, and he attributes a lot of that to structural adhesives. You know, so I think we're, you know, we're going to see more and more oh, there's no question vehicle manufacturers it. going in that direction. Mm -hmm. in, in fact, one of the things, uh, you were at the iCar thing yesterday, and you know, one of the points they made, uh, Matt here talked about a lot more riveting. There's a lot more structural adhesives in that, too, in, in the F-150. I think we're going to see it explode in use. But what's very interesting, the Japanese are nowhere near structural adhesives. Toyota's way behind. Honda just doesn't believe in them at all. I asked, uh, remember we were on the, the 
the launch of the Fit, right. the Honda Fit, and I asked the chief engineer, so do you use any structural adhesives in this? And he recoiled in horror and said, no, this car is designed for human beings. No. As if, you know, a glued up car is just going to wad up in an accident. Well, but, but I think they're way behind. I think they're But, they're but let's not out. forget that, that in, in all cases where structural adhesives are being used and at least where metals are involved, okay, mm -hmm. this, is, this is different than, you know, putting together a Corvette or something like that, that you're actually welding and gluing. So basically, you're, you're, you're basically putting the bead of adhesive down and then actually you doing the spot, spot weld, weld right. right through the thing. Right. So, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a belt and suspenders approach, but it, it, it really improves the performance of the vehicle. There's no question. Well, it's like, it's like building construction. I mean, adhesives are very common in housing and commercial, vehicle, uh, commercial building construction. Aerospace. And aerospace as well, and, and lend a lot of strength just by their nature. So, mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting to see the great leaps. And, uh, you know, if you go to, like, the, the last generation CTS and the last generation Hyundai Sonata, they've gone from roughly, I, I'm going by memory here, never a good thing to do, but they've gone from about 12 feet of structural adhesives on the old ones to about 120 feet yeah, that's, on the that's, current that's ones. That's about where the ATS is at. I mean, yeah. it's, 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 I mean it's a lot. Significant. Of, of, yeah. and, and one of the ways that you can get weight reduction out of this, too, is, as I've, I've pointed out before, when you spot weld things, you have to leave room for these big robots to come in and do, 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 do their spot welds. So you have to compromise your body structure to allow access for the robots. Whereas if you glue the stuff, you don't have to do right. it. And then you so have you can have the is. easy places to spot weld, and you can optimize your design for lightweight and strength. And then but if they go okay. laser welding, then we're all good. Laser welding is really cool. We're yeah. all good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In some cases, though, you can optimize a panel's mass by leaving holes that the robots use as access holes to, right. mm -hmm. to weld up the body. So, uh, yeah, you mentioned Cadillac Coupe. We have a Lexus Coupe coming as well, yeah. uh, V8 rear drive coupe. So that'll be interesting, probably low volume, but... Um, launch for that coming up pretty soon. And, of course, all this aluminum and lightweight and everything that we're talking about is, uh, you know, the EPA came out earlier this week sort of congratulating the automakers, patting them on the back, saying, hey, you guys are a little bit of ahead of the CAFE standards. And, Lindsay, you were at the ICAR conference yesterday. Larry Burns, former head of R&D at uh, General Motors, made the point that up to now, since 2009 to today, car companies had to improve their fuel economy fleet-wide 0.8 miles per gallon a year. In 2017, it ramps up to 1.6 miles per gallon per year. And that may not sound a lot, but as Larry pointed out, that's twice the rate of improvement they've achieved so far. And I'm just wondering, Tim. what do you guys think? Is the car industry with the cooperation of consumers buying the right mix of cars, going to be able to keep up with these numbers. Well, at, at some point on that curve that Larry was talking about, because we talked about this later, the low-hanging fruit drops off. It's all gone. You know, I, so, I think it's been picked already. I, I mean, you could argue that things like, you know, there's more, more grill shutters coming. There's more, you know, even going from a wider footprint tire to a narrower tire. I mean, there's still some of that involved, but you're going to be hitting basic laws of thermodynamics at a certain point. You know, basic physical laws that, uh, you know, unless you make the vehicle smaller or put really skinny tires on them or go down to, you know, uh, a lot of discussion about VW going to cylinder deactivation on a four-cylinder engine because you only need 15 horsepower to propel a vehicle at 60 miles an hour. So at what level then does this optimization really become super aggressive and at what cost? You know, I mean, we're talking about light weighting and then you look at a Tesla, there's a thousand pounds of batteries in that car. So, you know, either you get rid of that battery through fast charging, which again becomes this nightmare, you know, just nightmare infrastructure scenario. Uh, it, it, at some point, you know, on that curve, that, that one MPG, uh, you know, rate, uh, it's going to be really tough to achieve, I think. You right. Know? Two, two, two points on this. Yeah. One, this, this is like dieting, right? So if you're dieting and you lose 10 pounds like that, right? 
but that last five pounds, tough. It's a bitch, right? Tough. I mean, it's and and, <laughs> yeah. and so so that's basically what this comes down to. It's no different than that, right? Right. right? And number two is is that, um, you know. I, I think we perhaps underestimate the possibility of there being technical solutions to solving some of these problems. So to your point of the thousand pounds of batteries that uh, uh, Tesla needs to have in its car as well, you know, um, I was reading today about how Google and IEEE have put a million dollars on the table for anybody who will make an inverter for electrically powered devices, okay, so we're changing DC to AC. They're saying that right now it's about the size of a picnic cooler. A million bucks to whoever can bring it down to about the size of a tablet, okay? So yeah. these people are convinced, right, that we're going to have these technological breakthroughs. So you have something like that, then what happens to your, your car batteries, right? Right. right. Far less, and I mean, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so I mean, we're going to have these huge changes, and I think we're going to have these changes Maybe. faster rather than slower. Maybe uh, Panasonic announced today they're kicking in, uh, you know, three hundred million dollars to go with Tesla for with the Giga factory. Right. Uh, I'll believe it when I see it. In the sense that I don't think that even Elon Musk is going to pour five billion dollars into a factory right off the bat. He's got three billion raised. Well, I know that, but what I'm saying is, I think. What Elon will do is build one third of that. And then if the market catches up, he'll add the second third. And then if the market catches up, he'll add the third, which is okay. But I hope he goes that route because, you know, you look at Nissan, which is way overcapacitized itself for electric cars and batteries. There's no way in hell they're going to make any kind of return on that money at all in this decade, not any. Yeah. So. Yeah. You know, and that's what I see with the, the cafe thing. If, if the American public was running out and buying hybrids, plug-ins, and electrics in the quantity that was forecast just a few years ago, we wouldn't even be having this cafe discussion. Can they keep up with cafe? Right. It's not happening. Right. It's not happening anywhere in the world, by the way, not just in the United States. I think the only thing that will drive it is regional restrictions on um, combustion engines restricted from city centers and these kind of things where you don't have a lot of choice. Uh, you know, something that is running purely on electric power is going to be your only choice on that. And maybe they are kind of optimized plug-in hybrids that will give you a 10-mile 10 mile range, which is peanuts and kind of useless, except for when you do want to take your car into London and you can only get into the financial district or the shopping district on pure electric power. Which Boris Johnson announced this week in London. So, I mean. Uh, Boris, right. Yeah, yeah. So, so that, was, that, was, that was announced this week that, that I think it's by 2020 that in a section it's a, you know, zero emission Zero zone. combustion zone, yeah, right. zero combustion zone. Yeah. So, so, I mean... Zero combustion is the right way to say it, because yeah. those vehicles are not zero emission. Right. So I, I don't mean to pick, you yeah. know, bones here, but, yeah, zero combustion is a better way to put right. it. Right, but so, so you see that happening. And then, then right. um, the Chinese just came out with the uh, announcement last week about, uh, you know, really heavily funding people who buy electric vehicles, because their plans aren't working well. Look, well. They, they, yeah. they've already been heavily funding them. The big thing is that they said... No government cars can be imported. And by the way, government cars going forward are, have, are going to have to be these, what they call new energy vehicles. Doesn't mean necessarily pure electric, but could be plug-in or hybrid, but that's how the Chinese are gonna try to push it. Well, there's the elimination of automobile sales tax for EVs compared to gasoline or hybrids, which is 8.5%, so right off the bat. But I'm saying, yeah. uh, uh, even up to now and going back a few years in Shanghai and, and Beijing, you've been able to tap into eighteen to $19,000 in incentives to be able to buy an electric. And they buy fewer electrics than we do with our $7,500 tax credit. Yeah, I, I still think there's a lot of optimization on combustion engines that's coming. This auto and diesel cycle, these guys were so bright 150 years ago. They created these devices that have all this headroom for evolution and development. And combined with, with uh, belt alternator starters, smaller batteries, switching on and off, I, you know, maybe pure battery EVs will be the, the brunt of the market. Who knows when in the future? But I, I think certainly in our lifetimes, uh, we're not going to see big penetration on, on pure electric vehicles. Just, just not seeing that. So I'll be driving hybrid, I mean, hydrogen cars. Well, who knows? I mean, it seems to be, you know, talking to Burns again, um, 
you know, Toyota's bet on fuel cells and hydrogen, I mean, they've, they've optimized a lot of things. I mean, he's kind of seen into the program and likes what he sees. Yeah, I, I still like my, the, the line of somebody in the industry who told me, here's our choice. We can lose $14,000 on every electric car we sell and get three ZEV credits. Or we can lose fifty thousand dollars on every fuel cell car and get seven credits. Yeah, yeah, we, 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 it, that's true. That's true. Hey, Gary, you we'll make you, it up in volume. Yeah, we'll make it up. That's, that's right. You you raised a uh, a good thing. Is Sergio Marchione going to rob Chrysler to feed Fiat? Rob Fiat. No. no rob, rob yes. Chrysler yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, because you know, the Fiat Group came out with its financials for the first half of the year and. Ain't looking good. No. And, you know, so you have the situation. You say, well, he has all these grandiose plans, which he laid out, right, and that they're going to be. And he's spending how much money on uh, Alfa Romeo right now? And he made that announcement. Oh, cool money. It's like $5 billion, I think, he's investing in that. So, you know, when when these numbers came out and you, you look at these plans, I began to think back to the days when Daimler owned Chrysler. And, you know, and we saw what happened there, right? I mean, you, you clearly remember, weren't you? Uh, mm. You were working there, with there right? at the time? No, no, no. Oh, I left there right before, right before that. Yeah, you yeah, got yeah. out and when the getting was good. Right, right. But, I mean, so from what you knew before you left and what you saw after you left, I mean, was that a situation where there was, like, uh, a lot of money being taken away from programs and projects? Well, I think the Chrysler could... before Daimler, um, as I recall, had like $10 billion in ready cash in the bank, 10 or 12, 10 to $15 billion, something like that. But even the executives looked at what they had to do in terms of uh, global platforms. They were still a North American-centric uh, company. And I think there was, a, there was something in the, in the Vlasic book where uh, Tom Gale was running international at the time, and they landed somewhere, and they just realized there was a realization when they were on the airplane that this thing, no matter how far we push it, we cannot push it as Chrysler. So, I mean, that money went out the door very quickly. Uh, you guys know what vehicle programs cost. I mean... You know, so so what they're doing, I mean, he was smart to grab onto Chrysler, but I mean, it was kind of a lifeboat for the moment, I think. And we, we talked years ago about Fiat being very regional. You know, it's a, basically an Italian market company. Um, I, I think Chrysler has really helped push him along for a long time now. But I mean, what's the what's the next step for him? Yeah, that, that I, I agree with Gary. I, my, that's my fear is that Sergio's got ambitious plans. I think there, it's an astute plan, by the way, too. I don't think it's a stupid plan at all. But my fear is that all the funding is going to come out of Chrysler, and will they maintain the proper funding for the full Chrysler lineup? Yeah, they're going to do Jeep. Right. Yeah, they're going to do Ram. But what about Dodge and Chrysler? Do they get starved to feed the big increase at Maserati and, and Alpha? Yeah. I mean, Alfa Romeo, I mean, you know, who wouldn't give anything to have two automotive words that roll off your know, tongue like so that? sexy. And, Alfa and, Romeo. And you even see old Milanos and stuff, which was kind of the tail end of the old bad Alphas, and they still turn your head around today. Uh, and there's some four C's that are out, you know, among us journalists out there, and I can't wait to drive that car. Uh, but, um, you know, the investment to put that thing on the right tracks and, and bring it to this market, and then they kind of dangled that brand out for fiat dealers in this market. And the Roadster was going to be an Alpha, now it's going to be a fiat. So who knows? Well, you know, and you get back to the thing, is, is there going to be sufficient volume of that car in order for it really to make a difference? Right. Right? I mean, right. or is it, is it just like a little, you know, cherry on top? And it's like, oh, isn't that wonderful? Yeah. But, you know, the real substance is missing. And uh, so it, it, would, it, would be, it would be really a shame, I think, if... That indeed happens. Now, you know, there was that rumor, what was it, last week that Volkswagen was interested in, in buying Fiat. And, of course, Sergio's like, no, 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 that is, that is not going to happen. But he did say at mm. the uh, uh, financial conference uh, yesterday that, that, you know, he was interested in partnering with uh, other companies wherever he could. So I think he's, he's holding out, um, he's holding the door open a little bit, I think. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm looking at it totally differently. I, I, I think these decisions are being made above Sergio's really? head. I do. In the Vatican. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was the old Vatican. Yeah, right. yeah. Francis will have nothing to do with that's that sort right. of thing. No, stick with me for a second. So here's my, my analysis of this. If, if you go back 100 years ago and you look at a photo of Tsar Nicholas and Kaiser Wilhelm, 
and Prince Albert out of Belgium and King George out of England. And you lay out those photos, you go, which is which? It's the same guy. I mean, they're all the same. They're all cousins, right? And <laughs> Europe did this for hundreds of years. They would have royalty intermarry because, hey, if you're my cousin or uncle or aunt or whatever, I'm not going to go have war. I'm not going to go conquer you. So I wonder if, you know, everyone's got these questions now. What's going to happen with the EU? I mean, it's not rolling out like it was supposed to. And you've got some very strong parts of it and very, very weak. And now you got this crazy Ukraine thing. And what's that going to do? And I wonder if, if the royalty of Europe today, the PX, the Agnellis, the Peugeots are all saying, you know, why don't we sort of intermarry and let, let's exchange some, some equity amongst each other. Let, let's make sure we've all got some skin in the game so we look out for one another. Because this idea of fiat being sold to Volkswagen doesn't make any sense at all to me. And so I'm trying to create some other scenario that does make sense. I don't know if it so does. So this would be some sort of uber karetsu that... Uh... Yeah, but, uh, but very much with the, the families. Because it was not mm. fiat. That, you know, this is a story that broke out of uh, a, a German magazine. What, what, what's the, the controlling company of the fiat group? Exor, I think is the name. It was supposedly Exor that had approached the PX. It was not Fiat that had approached Volkswagen. Hmm. And that's what got me thinking, like, wait a minute, I, I, I think there's a whole nother level to this discussion that, you know, is hmm. not the car companies trying to buy each other out. Well, PX, that arrangement still amazes me. I mean, that is an unwieldy organization that he's got with all of those brands. Um, and, you know, I mean, a one million unit U.S. sales target that I don't think they've got a chance in, 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 hell. in, in hell of meeting for 2018. Uh, they keep adding brands at a time when, you know, simplification seems to be kind of, you know, more of a way to go. And then just the thought of any alliance or acquisition of, 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 of a fiat size or, you know, even to add a Chrysler to their organization. I mean, how do you consolidate? Where, where do you find the, the dividing lines? The thing is already enormous. So you remember the Ed Sullivan show and that guy would be on there and he'd have those plates and he'd be spinning them on those sticks? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> it's, it's, it's sort of like that. Right, right. I had somebody tell me that they thought, I admire Volkswagen. I admire the way that they run these multiple brands. I think they're doing it right. But somebody recently told me, when Piek retires, that's when it's all going to fall apart. Mm. That he is the mastermind and has got the power to pull it all together. And then when he's gone, boom, it all falls apart. I'm not sure I believe that. I, in fact, I don't even think I do. But that's some of the feedback that I'm hearing out there from people who I think know what they're talking about. Yeah. So, so, John, you wanted to defend dealerships. Tell us about I this. I do. I do. You know, uh, I, I think, you know, Elon Musk has been getting all these accolades for trying to start his own stores and... And the public is totally behind him. And so he's going through state by state, or at least a couple of handfuls of state. Because that's how the franchise laws work. Right. You, and he's carving out an exemption for himself. And I, I think that people haven't thought through or are not aware of what I think are some of the benefits of the franchise system. So, for example, uh, you know, go out and look at how many Toyota stores are in your area or Chevy stores or Ford stores. There's a lot of them. And they all have to compete against each other. And how do they largely compete? On price. So if these are all company stores, forget your haggling and negotiations and all that. That's out the window. The factory sets the price and the stores sell it at that price. And then when you go in to buy a new car too, you've got a trade-in. Well, any dealer today will happily take your car, no matter what brand it is, They'll give you a, a wholesale price. They'll stick it in their used car lot, and they'll sell it at a retail price. But they'll happily make the transaction for you. You think any factory store is going to be interested in taking some other cars, some other brand's used car and sell it? I say no way in hell. So when you go to, just for kicks, go to your local Tesla store and say, what about my trade-in? They send you to AutoNation, a dealership. Mm. You know, and... Uh, when it comes to warranty work or uh, recalls, dealers love it. I mean, they, they, they rub their hands in glee yeah. because they do the work and the factory's got to pay them. So they see recalls and warranty as something to jump on. It's great. Yeah, we're going to help you out, Mr. Car Owner, Ms. Car Owner. But if it's a factory store, how willing are they going to be to say, oh, yeah, we'll take care of all that right now? 
because the factory stores will look at that as an expense, not as a revenue stream. And then just, just to make the final point, in Europe, they have sort of a hybrid system. Car companies can own a certain percentage of stores. The rest has to go through independent franchisees. Daimler is getting crucified right. by the analyst community right now, telling it, dump all your company stores. Why? They're not very good at selling product, and they all lose money. Okay, yeah. so, so yeah. Let's, let's, let's assume all of that is, is true, okay? You know, the first thing that comes to mind is, so when's the last time you used it as a travel agent? No, never mind. Um, so so, so dis, dis, Delta has still has to compete with American for your dollar the same way that United does in U.S. Air and so on, right? I mean, that, right. There's, there's still competition there, so I wouldn't be so concerned about the price, okay? Um, but, but the thing is, is that, okay, so let's say that Musk has Tesla stores. Why does that mean that dealers have to go away, uh, independent franchise dealers? I mean, you could have both operating and whoever, and, and so you don't, as, but as, I, but as consumers, we benefit even more. Yeah, well, uh, what, what I, I guess another point to make is we're all pretty sure the Chinese are right around the corner. So are they going to come into the American market and say, hey, we don't want to deal with this franchise system? They're selling at Walmart. You, you, you've already set the precedent. Elon got an exemption. We want an exemption. And now I think it, I don't think that would benefit uh, those car companies that are locked into the franchise system. I don't think it benefits the franchise dealers. I don't, actually, I don't think it benefits the consumer if that happens. Well, it certainly isn't going to prove that um, service at a factory store can be great and it can be, it can be bad. I think about this, you know, talk about competition. I think about this every time I watch a Tigers game and there's one on top of the other, a Chevy dealer ad, the local Dodge dealer ad, the Ford dealer ad. And I, and I, think, I think you're right, you know, to a degree that we're so used to shopping from Amazon and these kind of things that, well, maybe if the dealer system went away, but I think if it did go away, people would realize really quickly that funding for the Little League team, funding for the local chamber of commerce, et cetera, et cetera, you're right, Gary, it might come from the owner or the, the manager of a factory store. I don't think it would be as forthcoming as we have today. And I think we take that for granted, uh, you know, what, what the dealer, maybe we don't know what the local car dealer does for the community. You really see it in a community where the car dealer dries up and goes away, uh, that you don't have those, those extras and, those, and, and that financial help. See, remember we had Jim Dollinger on the show a few yeah, weeks ago? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, okay, and, and so he basically was a dealer, right? But his approach was he would sell you a car. He would make sure that you had the car that you wanted, okay? One in a million guy, which probably explains why he was so, so incredibly successful. Now, look around here. I was, I was very surprised. So um, we're here in Southeast Michigan, since many people are not in Southeast Michigan who are listening or watching us. So I was surprised Don Massey Cadillac is gone. Right. Suburban and Cadillac. Suburban Cadillac. Yeah. And so there's Suburban Acura right down the street, which is right next door to Suburban Toyota. Right. Which is right down the street, which is across town from Suburban... It's kind of pretty generic. You know, I mean, so, so we no longer really have these small independent guys anymore. They're going anymore. away. They're yeah, going, yeah, away. going away. So, right. so, so Don Massey was a guy, right, who right. would, you know, do his commercials. And, and I mean, there are still some Lula Rich. I mean, he's, yeah. he's no, another. The other thing was there's Longo dealer, Toyota in Southern California is like the biggest dealer in the world. Part of Penske, right. though. Part of Penske, right. Right. Penske so, is the second largest retailer next to AutoNation. So yeah. did these guys behave in the same way? In terms well, of supporting the local community, I mean, I mean it's, a good, it's a good question. I mean, if there was an Apple store, I mean, it's not like the local, it's not like Starbucks is involved with the local community to the degree that a car dealer is, or the local Apple store. I think we, just because it's the incumbent, we know what to expect from them. Could could change, maybe not, but I understand where you're coming from. And and have you really had a lot of good dealer experiences? I'd say more good than bad, but. You know, great experiences like the Dollinger experience would be. I mean, I, I've you know bought many cars over the years, and it's just like, well, you know, I've also got my teeth cleaned. But yeah, am I looking forward to it? Not necessarily. <laughs> right. Hey, uh, we're we're getting down towards the end here. We've got a a, a number of other questions coming in, but I, I, did you guys 
prepare any rapid fire questions? Sort of. To, to short shoot at each other? Well, well I'll, I'll tell you, just to, to Matt's point, um, mid sized pickups, will Americans embrace, embrace them? You know, I, I, think, I think this is a very interesting pickup war that we're getting into. We've got the towing war on the heavy side, we've got the materials war and lightweighting and efficiency in the middle of the market, uh, led by Ford, but, you know, the others are coming in. I mean, you know, Dodge's shot really a couple years ago was, was a major shot with all the technology they put on Ram. So we've got that battle there. Now we've got, now we've got mid-sized trucks coming in. We know Toyota and Nissan are going to, you know, come out with all news on them. Hyundai's been a wild card there. Honda didn't work out with the Ridgeline. I mean, that had a lot of promises, a unibody. So, you know, mid-sized pickups. What do you guys think? I think yes. I think there's going to be a market there. It was interesting to hear Matt say he, they don't think, Ford doesn't think that segment's going to grow. I don't know. I, I wish I had a dollar for every viewer who wrote in and said, I want a smaller truck. Yeah. And, and also to aluminum. Uh, the next all news from GM and Chrysler, aluminum intensive or not? Gary? Mm, not. I agree. Gun? Not. Uh-huh. Right. More aluminum, but not like Ford's right. gone. Okay, not that I, investment. Nano steel, it's, carbon fiber, yeah, it's, it's, high strength steel. I, I think they'll go with a combination. I don't think they want to admit, yeah, Ford was right. Yeah. <laughs> so even if they think it's the right way to go, they won't go that way. But, but yet now you've well, got you Ford. Well, Cafe earlier, though, in talking about, you know, how they need to make these incremental changes. And so it is going to have to be a mixed material solution. And from the point of view of, you know, Ford has gotten all the publicity out of aluminum. So the second user of aluminum, you know, yeah. so whoever came out with the first aluminum beer can, they won. The second guy, who knows? But, but what this does is it allows you to then optimize powertrains. And that's the whole thing. I mean, it's all what the EPA number is going to require. So when you got that platform down, now the bandwidth between number of cylinders and displacement can be even wider than it is now. So uh, I, I, I don't know. I think, I think with fuel economy is still pretty affordable, quote unquote. But, I, you, know, I, you know, the industry's put the capacity in thanks to Ford in terms of rolling mills and everything else. I don't know. I, think, I don't think it's going to be a pride thing. I think it's going to be a practicality thing. So, oh, which is why I think it'll be a mixed material solution. Yeah. Yeah. All right, here's a funny one. The official factory team of Nissan for the V8 Supercar Series in Australia is the Jack Daniels Racing Team. Woohoo! That's Jack Sign Daniels, me up. number seven Stop's bourbon. going to rise again! So, all right, is this a good idea to have a race team that's sponsored by Jack Daniels? I mean, not Jack Danielson. Yeah, yeah. As, as sponsor, well, yeah, look, uh, you know, Bud Light's been in NASCAR and uh, uh, Miller, and uh, it's nothing new. It's... This is just hard liquor, that's all. Yeah, I, I don't know. It, it's kind of a mixed bag when you look at auto racing. And, I, I mean, if you look at the tobacco companies for years, that kind of thing, uh, is it really going to influence people, Jack Daniels? I don't know. I mean, Marlboro, there's a Viagra Mar car out Marlboro there. Marlboro spent a lot of money. There thinking, was. Yeah, there was, right. Marlboro spent soft. a lot of money thinking yeah. that that would work out. So, uh. <laughs> All right, Range Rover, Sport, Range Rover Sport SVR, 550 horsepower performance version of the Range Rover Sport, laps the legendary Nordschleife circuit in Germany in 8 minutes, 14 seconds. How relevant is that? Not at all to me. No, no, particularly for that vehicle. That's an odd one that they, that they did that exercise with a Range Rover. Well, yeah, I, yeah, I don't see the point in it. You know, that's supposed to be the best 4x4 four by, four by far. You know, and to me, that speaks of its off-road capabilities. You know, you want to go to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro to, or to the bottom of, uh, you know, the Negev Desert. You know, that, that's what you take. But lapping the Nordschleife, nah. Yeah. I, I, I wouldn't buy it to go lap at Nürburgring. All right, another one. So Mark Templin, head of Lexus, told Automotive News, and I quote, To be honest with you, you can't build a Lexus with the quality, the durability, the reliability, the craftsmanship, the content that we put in a Lexus, and sell it profitably under $30,000. Oof, you take that. You just can't do it. Close quote. Is that dog bites man? <laughs> no, that's, that's oof. Take that, Mercedes CLA. You know? <laughs> Look, Lexus has said that uh, on this show, too, that, you know, they're not going to go down market, that they see that uh, with, with BMW, Mercedes, Audi, all moving down market, they see that as opening the door for them. 
And, you know, I would think that Lexus and uh, or, or uh, Lincoln and Cadillac would look at it the same way. They and infinity. They don't have to go down market. But I would say for the major brands, this is scary as hell that, you know, Mercedes is selling a, a sub thirty thousand dollar car. You know, why spend thirty thousand dollars on a on a Ford Fusion when you can buy a Mercedes? Yeah. The other is a flip to that, though, is. I think there's a commoditization of these in the luxury well, segment I agree. anymore, you know. Yep. And in terms of feature content and everything, it's pretty hard to pick, you know, a car like that with that prestige badge versus a Hyundai anymore. And to your point, you know, because we all know manufacturing pretty well, you know, as De Niro says in that kind of bogus car dealer ad, Lexus is just a Toyota, you know. <laughs> So, I, I, I mean, it's, it's not a matter of can they build it for that, is, is will, they, will they bring the price, you know, up or down to, you know, to make it either a Lexus or a Toyota. So, I don't know. You know, I, 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 think, I think Mercedes isn't what it used to be in my mind. Uh, Jaguar maybe isn't in my mind anymore. So... Well, I, I think it's a mistake for those brands to go down market. I agree. I, I, I think short term, they're going to make hay. Everybody who's getting their bonus for the next five years is going to make a lot of money. And then when the, the brand cachet starts to erode, they're going to be all cashed out. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Any others? That's all I got. Uh, you look, it's, it's probably a good time to wrap up the show anyway. We, we've covered an awful lot here today. I would just say, are the Detroit Tigers going to win the AL this year? Uh, yeah. You heard well, about the big news today. No, what? Well, they got David Price in a three-way deal with Seattle, and uh, um, Price is the new pitcher. They got rid of Austin Jackson and Drew Smiley, who both played in today's game. They pulled Jackson out of the out of the field today, broke the news to him. The cameras were in the dugout, and everybody's hugging him like, "See you later." Wow. Yeah. The hell we thought the, the car business was yeah, tough. Yeah, that'd be a hell of, <laughs> hell of a way to lose your job. you pull you off the field. It's, it's yeah. like, you know, hand him a bus ticket and say you're riding the dog. Yeah. Uh, well, they better win after moves yeah. like that. I, I, I'll just say that, you know, I think, you know, for a while, electrified vehicles was what we were all talking about. And now, now we're talking about pickup trucks. We're talking about towing ratings. We're talking about aluminum. You know, we're talking about midsize. Okay, here's uh, my one rapid fire tr question to you guys. Will the new aluminum F-150 be the first pickup with a 30 MPG highway rating? First new pickup, I think the midsize GM trucks will be. Mm, yeah. Yeah. I, I think F-150 is going to squeak in, and they've got a high fuel efficiency version. Um, yeah. I think it's going to be real close. The SFE. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think they might make 29 with this truck. I think that's my bet. Okay. Here's, here's the question. Will they be really, 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 really careful before they put that number out? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they better be. Hey, with that, let's wrap it up. Lindsay, great having you here, man. It was really good. Thanks, Jack. Yeah, Gary, great seeing you after yeah. a couple of week hiatus on my part. Yeah, and we'll see each other uh, up in Traverse City next week. Yeah, yes, we will. We'll, we'll be up there. And so want to thank all of you for having tuned in. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone. Your journey, our passion. And by Hyundai. See what makes Elantra so nice. Check out its style, interior space, fuel economy, and popular features now. Visit our website, Autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday nights at 6 p.m. Eastern. Get your daily news fix with Autoline Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There's all that and much more at Autoline.tv.